His real name is Evelyn. And of course, Evelyn is not a great first name for a kid from Vancouver Island. Uh, he was dubbed with the nickname Beaner because he liked beans on toast, having been from Britain. I mated him to the behavior of dressing up <laughs> in a moose costume and using that costume to sneak onto the golf course and retrieve golf balls in order to resell them on the internet. And I thought that was just absurd enough <laughs> to suit my book. And uh, we need that because I know that there are people living under rocks out there that do stuff like that. I'm Peter McCulley. That's Vince Dietrich, former drummer for Spirit of the West, turned author. Among other things, we'll talk about his second book in the Vickers series, The Vickers Knickers, named after the pub which was opened by the title character, Tony Vicker. We'll chat when Today in BC continues. Hey, it's the Moj, Bob Marjanovic. Join me on the Moj on Sports podcast on Black Press Media at todayinbc.com. Listen into conversations with well-known athletes and celebrities as we look behind the scenes at these successful people. Listen in to the Moj on Sports podcast on todayinbc.com. You'll also find the Moj on Sports podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon, iHeart, YouTube, and Google Podcasts, as well as mojonsports.com. Thanks for joining us today, Vince. Lovely to be here. Vince, you've been a musician pretty much all your life. You started on the drums at age six, spending 30 years with Spirit of the West. And then last year, you released your first book, and recently the second in the trilogy, the three-part series. For folks who may not be familiar with The Liquor Vicar, you tell us about the book, the series, the characters, the plot. The Liquor Vicar, the initial book, sets the table for this cast of characters and the landscape they live in. They live in a fictional town on Vancouver Island called Tai Lagoon. And uh, the main character is Tony Vicker, who's basically a failed rock star. He's a failed musician. He always had dreams of great grandeur, but uh, he was not able to achieve anything. He just wasn't sufficiently talented, and he always held the dream. So many of the guys I've known through the years, they still have the same hairstyle they had when they were in grade 11, and same pants, and uh, hearts of gold, and wonderful guys, but they just... Can't let go of that to dream of being in a heavy metal band and wishing it was still 1978. Did readers enjoy a lot of those tongue-in-cheek references that you'll find throughout the book? Being of a certain vintage, there was lots of hidden Easter eggs here and there. Like they're discovering little clever plays on words in the middle of a completely different thought. I love wordplay. It's one of my favorite things. I love to fiddle around with stuff just in general conversation. I enjoy that, and most of my friends enjoy it too. And it can be punish, punny, but we do it in such a way that hopefully it's elevated beyond just the obvious. And I enjoy it. And I think people of our age really enjoy that kind of stuff. It's not quite hip for younger people. That helps separate who's going to like the books and who isn't going to like the books. Because a 20-year-old at the U of T is probably not going to read my book and go, wow, this is hilarious. <laughs> but people older than that, people who maybe know the band, the Spirit of the West, and people who know how important the content of the lyrics always were and personalities of the people behind that group, they might get a little more of a loving feeling towards that kind of silly British-style wordplay. It's how I am, and I just continued doing that in the book. So the first book, The Liquor Vicar, was very fast-paced, and that was intentional because, as you mentioned to us when you chatted about it in season one, that you had wanted to pitch it as a television program as well. Yes, I think to a certain extent, obviously was a novel, and it was meant as a novel, but I wanted it short, punchy, visual, easily imagined as being on a television show. So I wrote it in that way. So it almost has some aspects of being a treatment for television. And it was effective for me. I did just sign an agreement with Sugar Skull Films. And we together are going to find a broadcaster for a television series for Tony Vicker and his cast of characters. The Vicker's Knickers is the second book in the trilogy, which we're wanting to chat about today. It has a completely different speed. Was that intentional on your part? It was. I just didn't feel the need, the impulse. I just didn't feel it was right to be that punchy for the second book because 
I had all these characters that I'd dreamt up, and I, I just wanted there to be a little more hip swivel in the tempo of the book and allow some of the characterizations to grow, some of the interiors to be a little more descriptive, and some of the action to not be so cheek by jowl. I just wanted a little more breathing space in there. Some of that is just from more experience. After having written my very first book, I realized that my punchiness was effective, but it was not necessary for the next book. So having been a musician on the road most of your adult life, I'm guessing many of the characters in the first couple of books of the Tony Vickers trilogy have been drawn on real-life inspiration, except for maybe Beaner Weens, whose name was likely drawn from a weekly dinner staple. He was. In fact, I describe it in the book that Beaner Weens, Beaner is his nickname, his real name is Evelyn. And of course, Evelyn is not a great first name for a kid from Vancouver Island. He was dubbed with the nickname Beaner because he liked beans on toast, having been from Britain. I mated him to the behavior of dressing up (laughs) in a moose costume and using that costume to sneak onto the golf course and retrieve golf balls in order to resell them on the internet. And I thought that was just absurd enough (laughs) to suit my book. And we need that because I know that there are people living under rocks out there that do stuff like that. My good friend, my bandmate Jeffrey Kelly, is the one who actually does retrieve golf balls. When he told me that, I almost dropped the phone. I said, that's going in the book, man. That is madness. And he was cackling away. He said, yeah, I call them white gold. If I could retrieve as many as I lose, I'd probably be in the money too. Precisely. (laughs) He's exceedingly thrifty. (laughs) So this is just another example of his thriftiness. Well, he was in a Scottish Celtic oh, music band, right? So. He is very Scottish. He was born there. <laughs> Let's talk about Tony Vicker for a moment. In the first two books, poor Tony, he's been through it all. Just when he thinks he's got back on track and life is good, he becomes a father, but not in the traditional sense of becoming a father. Yeah, he finds a baby abandoned on his doorstep in the middle of a blizzard, and he has to take this baby and take care of it for a certain amount of time while the blizzard completely shuts down the town. And he realizes by the time that the officials can come to take the baby away, he's in love with a little girl. (laughs) He and Jackie, his girlfriend, have fallen in love with this baby and their lives have changed. They've pivoted on a dime, so to speak. When he sees the baby, it's just this thing in a box on his doorstep and he's thunderstruck. On top of all that, Tony having the notoriety of being able to tell the future, at least from the first book, he seems to be skirting the issue in the second book, but he can also see ghosts now. This is part of the uh, Tony Vickers story. He's a pretty t-shirt and jeans kind of guy. He's not highfalutin at all, and uh, he may or may not understand the more spiritual aspects of music, which is his favorite hobby, but he is discovering something about himself. And as he changes, his spirituality grows and his experience is starting to broaden. For example, he thinks he sees a black blob in his hotel, a ghostly black blob, the void, the famous void figure. And uh, he tells everybody else there, he points at it when he sees it, they can't see it. So he really questions his own sanity and he doesn't know what's going on with himself. He doesn't realize that he might be opening up to much broader horizons And he hasn't got any clue that perhaps the growth that he's been forced to go through is what's triggering this. But uh, some of that's for book three. Well, in book one, Tony was able to predict the future. And of course, that always has implications. And in book two, there's an obnoxious reporter that shows up who's hiding out. He's following Tony around and trying to catch him doing something and spread it all over the tabloids. I thought, this guy reminds me of that reporter on the airplane in Die Hard. (laughs) Is that what you were going for? Obviously, this guy is from whole cloth, but that particular actor's face was in my mind early on (laughs) as I was building the character. (laughs) William Atherton, I think his name is. Yes. He's just such a great bad guy, such a slime ball when he wants to be. He was also the slime ball in Ghostbusters, if memory serves. So I liked him for that character. Sometimes you have an image in your mind when you're drawing a character. It evolves and it changes with time. But initially you go, I want to write a guy like that or a a woman like that. And they all do change and they get filled in. When you see somebody for the first time, you meet them at a social event and you go, 
okay, I've got a read on this person, but you know them for a while, and then they look different to you because you know them more deeply, and it actually changes how you perceive their looks. That's the more spooky part of it. When Today in BC continues, Vince Dietrich talks about what he's up to in the music business and part three of the Tony Vickers series. Why spend hours searching dealerships, comparing makes and models? Find the best of BC's inventory in one place, todaysdrive.com. You'll have access to inventory across BC where you can easily find a vehicle that fits your needs and gets you where you need to go in comfort. Get in the driver's seat. Don't miss out on the many options we have available for you. Powered by Black Press Media, todaysdrive.com connects you with exclusive new and used car deals. Today in BC is a Black Press Media podcast. I'm Peter McCulley. Vince, you mentioned that it took a couple of years of solid effort to write The Liquor Vicar, as that was your very first novel. How long to write The Vicar's Knickers, and where are we with part three? I would say it took a year to write it, and then it took another year to rewrite it, because I had to recap the whole first book for the second book. You have to do a recap so everybody knows who the characters are, where they're coming from, what their basic story is. Recaps are a lot more difficult than they seem they might be because you don't know how much is agonizing repetition, how much is absolutely required. It's a trial by error situation. So I really stabbed at that numerous times. I think I found a good balance, maybe a page or two too long, but that's it. I didn't go a chapter or two too long, I don't think. I feel good about that. Then once the story got going, I felt very comfortable. I felt really good about spreading out a bit. And instead of keeping it spare and down to 50,000 words, I took it up to closer to 70,000 words. There's a lot of extra detail, inner thoughts and description. and It's got a lot more soul, but it's a little slower. Did the process change in any way from book one to book two for you writing? Uh, similar, but... I was less fraught in the second one. Once I got through the recap, I was less fraught because I knew I could do it. I'd proven that I could write a book properly and jump through all the steps. So I didn't doubt that I'd be able to hit all the marks. I knew I could. I did that, but there was still a ton of staggering around, wall-eyed, kind of mumbling and scratching my butt with my wife going, what is wrong with you? I'm writing, honey. I'm writing. You don't look like you're writing. You look like you're scratching your bum. So Posted notes all over the house. All over my computer in the office, for sure. Yeah. I use my phone. <laughs> when I get an idea and I'm in the car or something, I text myself the mm-hmm. idea And so I have these text messages to myself with these fragmented, ridiculous ideas that I have to expand on when I get home because otherwise they don't make sense anymore. I look at that and go, garbage can. What does that mean? What does it pertain to? I have to do that kind of stuff because heaven forbid in this modern age, I could find a pen and a piece of paper. Being the drummer for Spirit of the West for so long, 30 years, and also being the manager, playing with Doug and the Slugs, BTO, Long John Baldry and others, would I be correct in assuming that even in retirement, it's difficult to somehow not be involved in the music business, whether that's helping guide a young career or maybe produce or just having that height and listening ability when you listen to the radio or television? (laughs) Yes, it's always there. I'm sure it's like when an athlete retires and they watch a ball game and they go, ooh, it's like that for me. But I'm not performing anymore. I'm not feeling it in my heart because I put everything I had into these performances. It was quite athletic, actually. I'm at the age now where I don't have as much jam and I don't want to go up there and do a a half-assed job. I just don't feel like it. And so I'm not playing, although I do sometimes come in and do a little guest slot on one album or something, or do some shaky tambourine bits or Mm -hmm. a background vocal. But what I will do is produce something or I will mentor. I enjoy mentoring because I think I lived the entire syllabus of what not to do in the music business. I've made every major mistake and managed to survive for the most part. So I can steer youngsters around a lot of really obvious toe stubs because you just get sucked into them. Well, you've been working with a young man. His name is Travis Matthews. Worked with him on a few tunes. His dad is Gordy Matthews. 
Gordy is an old friend. We used to play together all the time. Gordy was Katie Lang's original guitarist, an Edmontonian. And uh, he moved to Vancouver, and that's where I connected up with him, and I played with him a lot for about four or five years. And uh, he ended up having uh, three kids, two sons and a daughter, and his baby is Travis. He was asking me advice on an album that he'd done, and I explained that he needed to punch it up a little bit. He needed some tracks on there that were going to be a little more ear-catching, because as we know, people don't listen to the whole song if they haven't been grabbed by the song right off the top. So I had some input, and he asked me if I would help him do some additional tracks to punch it up to a higher level. I said, sure. And I managed to get the best studio in Vancouver, the best players in Vancouver, and created what must be the best mood in a recording studio for the last many years and plop this wonderful talent right into the middle of it and he just blossomed and we got him a few tracks one which is a cover and uh, the rest that he wrote and they turned out really well and he was very pleased and i gave him the vancouver experience in essence he's an edmontonian it blew the mind out of the side of his head well let's listen into one of those gordy wrote this it's called diamonds Take my head now, baby, please Take my head now And put your faith in me There is something you gotta see There are diamonds in the river tonight Take a breath of song Knowing that you've been involved in percussion instruments your whole life and then helping on the production of that particular track, I can hear the influence with that solid underlying beat. Yeah, all the percussion is me, but all the drumming is my great friend, Pat Stewart, who's Brian Adams' drummer, and uh, I just was going to be way too busy to play the drums and produce the tracks because the personnel coming through there, every one of them is a producer in his own. So when you're producing producers, you got to be on the ball. I just knew I was going to be too busy to do the drumming, so I asked Patsy to come in, and he did, of course. What you get is that heavy, rich, strong Vancouver sound. When we chatted in Season 1 of Today in BC, you were talking about the experience of having a kidney transplant. 
the kidney was donated by the husband of your niece. I thought perhaps you could provide us with an update on how you're feeling these days. Well, actually, I'm feeling very good. I managed to change around some of my medications. So if you've had a transplant, they give you a lot of dope, man. I took over 30 pills per day. Maybe I took all of the drugs possible, and I gained a lot of weight as a result of it. And I asked the doctor to uh, to help me lose some of this weight because if you're ballooning up 50 and 60 pounds above your weight, the good that the kidney transplant did is foreshortened quite severely. I'm down 50 pounds, and nice. I'm feeling a lot better, and I have better stamina, and now my shocking good looks are back, Peter. <laughs> I can see that. Yes. All the elderly (laughs) ladies wound as I vacuum or mow the lawn. I understand there's a recent addition to the family as well. My brand new grandson, his name is Louis, Louis, and uh, he was born on June 8th, and I already had two. My uh, older son, Perry, is the father of three now, my wife and I, grandparents of three boys. So Oliver, Parker, and uh, Louis... My son is not a musician at all. He didn't get that gene, but uh, he managed to uh, name them after great musicians without knowing it. King Oliver, Charlie Parker, and Louis Armstrong. So I'm delighted with that little secret. Not secret anymore. Will the grandkids be getting drum kits when they turn six? I seem to recall you told me that was about the age that you started. Oh, I actually got my first pro drum kit at age five, my fifth birthday, if you can believe that. A beautiful champagne sparkle Gretsch kit that I gave subsequently just when I was getting my kidney transplant. I didn't know if I was going to make it. So I gave that precious kit to Ellis Frank, who is the son of Tobin Frank, my bandmate in Spirit of the West. And he's a beautiful young musician. It was a symbolic act, pass the torch to him, and now he's got those drums, and he can play them, and he can play keyboards, and he can play guitar, and he can write, and he can sing, and he's just going to walk all over us old farts. It's what was just his name again, so we can... Ellis Frank. All right, watch for it. Yeah, he's a, he's a great talent. When we chatted in season one, I asked you what advice you'd give someone pursuing a career path similar to your own, especially on the writing side of it, because you have approached that later in life. So now that you've finished your second book, would you change your answer to that in any way? I do recall saying that you just have to not be knocked down by negativity and keep pounding away, making the calls, sending the emails. You do have to do that, but I'm changing a bit. I'm realizing that I've spent so much time intensely following my career and just pounding ahead, just mercilessly, regardless of rest or health or good vibes or anything, just go. I'm realizing maybe sometimes it's okay to just let it go, do good work, and then leave it there. Just try and be happy. So if you did get your foot in and climb up the ladder a little bit, try and enjoy it. I'd like to thank Vince Dietrich for being with us on this edition of Today in BC. If you have suggestions or comments, send us a voice message to podcast at blackpress.ca. You may be part of our podcast mailbag segment. You'll find Today in BC podcasts on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon, iHeart, and Google Podcasts. Podcasts.